We are thrilled now to welcome online Pat Gelsinger, the CEO of Intel, for a fireside chat with Chris Darby, Global Head of Venture Investments and Senior Managing Director at Cerberus Capital Management. So it's it's a real um, honor for me to be here speaking with my uh, my good friend Pat Gelsinger. Uh, Pat, you may not realize this, but we've known each other for 20, 20 or so years. And after 20 years, you're the Intel CEO and I moderate fireside chats for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chris. So good to be able to spend some time with you and uh, uh, participate in this super important chat. Well, over those 20 years, Pat, a lot's changed. We look the same, but, but a lot's changed, especially in the microelectronics industry. I, somebody said software was going to eat the world. It may have been Reed, actually. But over the last 20 years, it seems like microelectronics have eaten the world. Can you talk about what's happened over those 20 years and, and the effect it's had on Intel? Yeah. And, you know, over the 20 years, I mean, clearly, and, you know, I like to point back to the 1990 data that basically had 80% of semi-manufacturing in the U.S. and Europe and 20% in Asia. Those numbers have flipped, right? It's now 80% in Asia and 20% in the U.S. and uh, uh, Europe. You know, and as we saw in uh, COVID, all of a sudden, you know, the world had a semiconductor shortage. And we, and we woke up to realize that everything is going digital and everything digital runs on semis, right? So all of a sudden, it's like, I can't ship a $30,000 car, you know, because I'm missing a $1 microelectronic component. How did that happen, right? And all of a sudden, the economic implications, you know, I you know, was uh, meeting with one of the uh, defense industrial uh, CEOs and you know, says, well, you know, how many uh, Taiwan-made chips are in the F-35? Long pause. And the answer was, I said, you don't need to answer the question. The answer is not zero, right? You know, so the national security implications, the economic implications of that, you know, have just, you know, caused this wake-up call, you know, and, uh, you know, as I like to say, Chris, you know, where the oil reserves are has uh, defined geopolitics for the last five decades, where the technology supply chains are is more important for the next five decades, you know, as the entire world goes uh, digital. And, you know, the last conversation around AI, hey, everything AI runs on chips, right? You know, we're seeing an explosion of innovation. And for Intel, you know, we went through a bad decade. You know, we lost our way. We lost our technology leadership. And obviously, as I came back to the company two and a half years ago, it was like, we are going to fix this. You know, we're going to rebuild this iconic company called Intel. We are going to rebuild the technology, you know, position in the West, and we're going to rebuild manufacturing at scale. It's that important, you know, to the economies, to the geographies, to national security, to create geographically balanced and resilient supply chains for the most important thing for the next five decades. So I'm going to make your staff and the SESP staff nervous. I'm going off script. <laughs> what well, um, what are the KPIs that you would look to? How how does Intel have to adapt, and how yeah. do you measure that um, that adaptation over a, over a period of years and hopefully quickly? Yeah, you know, and there are probably three that I'm really super focused on, uh, Chris. You know, one is we have to get back to building the best stuff, right? And I have to have the best process technologies you know, that are delivering on that Moore's Law cadence, right? You know, this magic of silicon and Moore's Law, you know, exponential increase, a number of transistors, uh, the uh, computational capabilities, while you simultaneously have an exponential decline in the cost and power consumption of those devices. You know, that's the magic of Moore's Law that you're seeing that exponentially occur. And we have to get Intel back to the point that we're doing that. And I you know, launched us on this five nodes in four years. You know, generally a node takes maybe two years. You know, so that's 10 years worth of work, right, in uh, four years, you know, an audacious plan, but we're executing on it, right? And we, you know, every quarter we're updating on our progress and we just had our Intel Innovation Conference this week and, you know, I'm showing off Silicon Wafer after Silicon Wafer, you know, Intel 7, Intel 5. Four, Intel, uh, you know, three, Intel 20A, Intel 18A, what we're doing to really bring that back at the package and 
at the wafer level. You know, second KPI, you know, for me in that regard is, is that uh, we have to rebuild manufacturing, right, in U.S. and Europe. And, uh, you know, when we announced the uh, Ohio site, the Magdeburg site, you know, these were, you know, moments that I think are catalyzing the national interest. They're that important for jobs, for economy. You know, when I stood on stage and, uh, you know, with uh, President Biden, I said, today the Rust Belt ends. Today, the Silicon Heart Lane begins. You know, it's bringing up a well of, you know, emotion, commitment. Uh, nationalism that I think people realize how important this is. And, you know, to both uh, Secretary uh, Raimondo, you know, President Vanderlein, by the, you know, a decade, you know, let's go from 20% to 50% of semiconductor manufacturing back in U.S. and Europe, another KPI. You know, and the third one, you know, for me is, you know, part of this shift to Asia was foundry. Right. Where, you know, fabulous companies needed to go you know, elsewhere because, you know, the only national champion possible in this regard, Intel, we only manufactured our own chips. You know, I have to become a world class foundry, you know, to enable everybody's chips to run, you know, in those uh, factories. And, you know, in addition to work like the chips program office and so on to rebuild manufacturing, you know, we have to change our business model as well and enable, you know, every defense contractor, you know, every startup, you know, every uh, academic uh, program, but all of the, uh, you know, fabulous uh, suppliers that they have a world class source of leading edge technology at volume, you know, in a resilient supply chain in the West. So, Pat, they've only given us three hours for this conversation. <laughs> and, um, I want to unpack a couple of those things. You talked about Moore's Law, and yet we've heard a lot of people saying, is it, is it still alive? Is it still relevant? <laughs> What's your answer to that? Well, my answer to it is, you know, uh, you know, Intel's mission is Moore's Law is alive and well until the periodic table is exhausted. <laughs> I've heard you say that before. <laughs> you know, hey, you know, we are going to keep bending physics, science, chemistry, and finding ways to keep it going. And, you know, I always say that, uh, you know, Moore's Law, you know, it's not a law in the physical sense, right? But it's always been this observation that the innovative, creative genius of humanity is enabling us to sort of keep that exponentiality alive and well. And we always have about a decade of visibility, right? You get past the decade, it's like a foggy night. Oh, I can't quite see what's going to happen. But, you know, in the next decade, you know, we see, you know, four things. A new transistor type that we're just introducing with, you know, ribbon FET, new power delivery mechanisms with power uh, via, you know, lithography. You know, we can keep printing smaller, smaller things with EUV. But maybe the most important is 3D packaging. Where we're moving from two-dimensional, uh, you know, Denard scaling, as it's been called, to three-dimensional wafer-level assembly packaging, and we truly see that, you know, last year my uh, most complex chip was about 100 billion transistors, and at the end of the decade, we envision a 3D composition of silicon to be a trillion transistors in a single package. And you know, if you do the uh, exponential math on that. That's pretty much right on the line of Moore's law that we hit a trillion transistors by the end of the decade. And sitting here today, Chris, guarantee we will deliver that. We will make that happen. Okay, so this is easy. Technology, check. Got that? <laughs> Got that plan. Yep. You know, the Silicon Heartland that you've, you've, you've talked about, I think, eloquently and, and talked about the jobs and so on and so forth. There's, there's an equal conversation that has to go on around talent. Mm -hmm. You and I have mm -hmm. had the good fortune to work with minds like Steve Pulowski and Wen Han Wang and others. Um, how do we develop that next generation of genius and what role does government have to play? What, where does government and Intel have to come together to, to support that goal? How do you think about talent? Yeah, and maybe three different comments on that regard. One piece of the Silicon Heartland announcement that just really to me was very profound. You know, essentially, the technology boom has occurred on the coast, not in the center of the nation, right? And to me, part of this is also reaching into a broader talent base. 
right? And we and we've seen all of the Midwest schools. You know, hey, we had you know Michigan State and Ohio State in the same room and not throwing things at each other, right? You know, just like you know, hey, you know, this ain't happened in decades, right? You know, but you know, Purdue and Michigan State, Carnegie Mellon, right? You know, Case Western, right? Don't Illinois. forget Arizona State. Come on, yeah. don't forget Arizona hey, that's State. Not, yeah, but they were already doing well in this regard. <laughs> okay. Right near our site there. But all of these other schools, you know, kids left. Right now we say, come home. Yeah. Right. And it brings more of that talent base, but it's also the talent base in the community colleges, right? You know, how we reach into high schools, et cetera. You know, we have to make the technology attractiveness of the talent base better than ever in this regard and more comprehensive across the different layers. Remember, you know, I'm a community college graduate, right? I started as a technician at we'll, Intel. We'll get to that. Don't don't steal yeah. my thunder. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, reaching a broader portion of our talent base, and it needs to have second good programs. And this is part of NSTC, you know, refueling that pipeline, putting research dollars in the DARPA, universities, et cetera, you know, to be creating that talent pipeline for the future. You know, one of the things that I want to do out of our fabs is every shuttle program, as you say, the ability for kids to be designing advanced chips. How do we keep lowering the barrier, you know, that every school in the nation is doing advanced uh, semiconductor design work and microelectronics programs uh, as well? And the third piece is I think our immigration policies are all screwed up, right? If you're going to get a higher, you know, education degree from the U.S., right, you should come attached with a green card. We want the best and brightest minds of the planet to come here and stay here. And they've been the fuel of so much of the uh, tech boom, you know, that uh, I, I just think that is you know, implausible that we don't make that part of it. Send us your best people. We want them all. So, Pat, when you when you think about the role of a CEO. What you don't do is almost more important sometimes than what you do. When you think about Intel's core competencies, what businesses do you have to be in? What businesses are optional? And what businesses should you not be in going forward? Well, you know, I've said, you know, the two things that we're like have to get back to being really good at is, you know, we have to be the best technology providers at scale in the world. And we're going to do that for our internal products and for our foundry customers. And, you know, it's just this passion, you know, hey, have we figured out how to make the physics work yet? No, but we think we can. Okay, that's a business I want to be in, right? And, you know, we just announced, uh, for instance, this week, you know, that we're going to move the packaging industry from organic packages to glass-based uh, substrates. And when we move to glass, that means we get to integrate optics directly into the silicon connectivity. And, you know, silicon optics, you know, hey, this is, you know, this is the edge of what's possible. But yeah. if we're going to build the biggest AI machines on the planet, you know, I got to drive the picojoules per bit down by an order of magnitude and the uh, aggregate terabit, you know, capacity of an individual chip by up by a couple of orders of magnitude. We're going to enable those technologies. And we have to, just, you know, always be pushing forward, right, of the product and technology in conjunction together. And then the second I said is we got to build the best products. Right, you know, and you know, around x86 CPUs and GPUs, accelerators, you know, and this idea that we're going to make AI everywhere, right, in our PCs and our edge devices and the data centers and so on, you know, everything that computes, Intel's going to be in that business. If it doesn't compute, we're not going to be in that business, right? If it's not pushing the edge of technology, ah, hey, you know, it's going to be other people that can do that better. Right. And if it doesn't compute, there's going to be other people that do that better. So those are the areas that I've said. And, you know, since I've been here, we've exited nine businesses now. And I have some bets of, you know, some uh, incubation businesses that I think you know, could be the ones that uh, are truly game changing you know, for tomorrow. So it takes a lot of discernment to be a CEO. And you also have to be humble enough to know, hey, some of the bets that I put on the table, ah, they're not right. OK, let's pick the next ones. Yeah. So so Pat. Intel's a global brand. It's a global presence. And we're doing a lot to repatriate microelectronics here in the United States. We're making a lot of investments as a government. What are your conversations like with countries around the world 
um, in terms of the investment that Intel will continue to make in those regions and how you will maintain um, commitment around the world for, for Intel as that venerable brand. And, you know, the way I think about that, Chris, is, you know, there's three major markets of the world, Asia, China, right, Europe and Americas. And, you know, as we talk to leaders around the world, you know, and I've probably met with 35 heads of state since I've been in this uh, role as a CEO, that I want to make the supply chains balanced and resilient across those three you know, uh, uh, mar markets of the world. So when we go to Europe, you know, we've played a seminal role in uh, helping to shape the EU Chips Act because we want more of this manufacturing and technology in EU, right? You know, the U.S. is 12 percent. The EU is now 7 percent. Wow. Their situation is even more precarious than ours. And uh, the EU Chips Act, you know, passed uh, the uh, parliament. Uh, by a nail-biting vote a couple of weeks ago of 587 to 10. <laughs> you know, you know, they got the memo, right, at that point, you know, how important this is to their future and our German site, Polish site, you know, but this has to be across the geo. You know, it has to be more of the supply chain that they control. As I was, you know, meeting with one of the CEOs of the big three German car manufacturers, I said, I want you to be able to go up on the top of your building Get out the telescope and say, there's my fab, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. Just building more of that resilience in their supply chain, just like we want to do in the US, just like Asia is doing. And you know, since we began the work on the CHIPS Act, you know, the EU CHIPS Act has passed. You've seen strong efforts in India, right? Uh, Korea, Japan, uh, as well, as well as other nations stepping up to say, oh, we get it. And post-COVID, they're getting it. You know, they're making these investments. You know, industrial policy is not a dirty word, right? It's a national priority and something as important as uh, microelectronics. You're getting applause. Like, <laughs> you, you nailed that one, Pat. So we're in Washington, D.C., and the CHIPS Act was, was I think, just a, a, a really important moment in this country's history. What else should, you know, somebody makes you, Policy king for a day. <laughs> well, what else do know, we need to be doing, Pat? Yeah. So three things. One is we already touched on my immigration policy change. You know, second is, you know, it was chips and science. Right. The science pieces largely haven't been funded yet. Right. And, you know, so we need to finish the job of the chips and science. And right now, you know, our proposals you know, are in the hands of the CHIPS program office. We need those dollars to start flowing uh, quickly uh, for it. But we then need to go put legs on the science piece of this uh, as well, because that is the seed corn for the future of our nation. And then the third is, I fully expect that we need to have CHIPS too. Right. You know, we have to prove that chips one was good. Yeah. But, you know, this is a big, very uh, hard uh, effort to reverse you know, trends this way. And hey, I think we're going to be you know, two years from now. We need to go do chips, too. And building on the success of chips one and the Science Act, you know, to me, you know, industrial policy and something is so critical to the future of our economy and national security. You know, it can't be viewed as a one and done. Right. You know, this needs to be a policy view for multiple generations to come. So to me, those three and right, it needs to always be done. And I say this over and over again, you know, to me, the three, the three legs of our international policy should always be sell every product we can, right? You know, minimize technology flow wherever it's critical to our national interest. And third, always align with our allies. You know, our friends must be our friends you know, Europe, Asian friends, and we have to align our policies uh, with them. And to me, that's the formula, you know, for a successful industrial policy, international policy, and national security. So I'll, I'll put this one on a T for you because we're friends. Should there be a demand signal from government as well um, ar around, look, if you build it, we will buy it? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Governments do that all around the world, so should we, 
right? You know, we, we want to build our uh, national uh, industries. We want to, you know, right? You know, the question I asked before, you know, how many Taiwan made chips are in the F-35, right? Yeah. <laughs> this is so critical to us, right? You know, you know, for us in the future. So absolutely, it should be a demand uh, signal. I do, uh, you know, fully support the idea that, hey, you know, the government can put a thumb on the scale to uh, drive its policies. And I think that's appropriate. So, Pat, we've only got a few minutes left, and, and I think this might be the most important question I ask, and I'll frame it this way. I've got a 21-year-old daughter, and I want her to grow up to be Pat Gelsinger, not the moderator. Um, what advice would you give to young people today if they want to turn into Pat Gelsinger? You know, tell us about your, how did you get there, and what would you tell a young person? Well, you know, thanks, Chris. And, you know, I started as a farm kid and stumbled into technology, went to community college, got hired as a technician, you know, just the Cinderella American story. You know, there's no reason I should be sitting in this chair today by any means. You know, and I always say people should have a career map. One is they need mentors, you know, people that are making them better on the way. And obviously, one of my early mentors was Andy Grove. Right. I used to joke that Andy, you know, mentoring with Andy was like going to the dentist and not having Novocaine. <laughs> right. You know, he, he, he beat the snot out of you, but he made you better. Right. And, you know, hey, if you want to fully realize your career potential, you need mentors that are going to make you better. You know, second, audacious goals. You know, I wrote uh, early in my 20s, I wanted to be CEO of Intel. Right. You know, hey, it was such an outlandish statement when I wrote it. Right. You know, I'm a technician right, in the company. Right. And, you know, it just can't possibly be the case. But every time I sat in a meeting with Grove or Moore or Noyce, I would ask the question, oh, do I know enough to say what they said? Do I agree with what they said? Could have I done that as well? Became the sort of driving force. You know, for me, every day I sat in the building to saying, you know, what do I need to learn to be able to do that? You know, how can I position myself for that? You know, and the third I say is uh, passion, right? You know, pursue your passions, right? And for me, this idea of technology that I could work on something that, you know, truly changed the life of every human on the planet, right? Oh my gosh, I love technology, but I love even more the impact that it can have on humanity and you know truly on every person on the planet. You know, I've been blessed to work on, you know, things like USB. When my granddaughter plugs in her USB stick, she says, "Thank you, Papa." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. You know, I worked on Wi-Fi, right? You know, right policies and so on. And when you plug into Wi-Fi or don't plug in, Right. You know, it's just there, you know, it becomes this ambient expectation that, you know, oh, you know, if my hotel doesn't have Wi-Fi, well, hey, I'm not going there again. Right. You know, it's, you know, a global phenomena. Right. You know, pursue your passion. So, right. I say, you know, for those three, one, is, you know, right. Mentors, audacious goals, pursue your passions. You know, and obviously for anybody, right, you know, who's considering a career right now, hey, tech is it. Right. You know, STEM, but I call it STEAM, science, you know, technology, engineering, arts and math. Right. And all of those together, you know, we want to create more of that capacity you know, for tomorrow. So to me, math and STEAM, that's where it's at. Well, and I would tell the audience, I, I did end up at, at Intel for a short period of time 20 years ago. And Pat Gelsinger was kind thoughtful, welcoming. Um, he made my transition into Intel for as short as that stay was a, a truly memorable experience. And I'm, I'm deeply grateful for the friendship that, that uh, we've shared over these years. Ladies and gentlemen, please uh, join me in thanking our, our, our guest, uh, an American icon, Pat Gelsinger. Thanks, Pat. Thank you, Chris.